Hi everyone, welcome to Artsfest Online. Tonight we will be joining Dr Phil Nichols as he recounts the history of the Martian Chronicles by Ray Bradbury. Dr Nichols is course leader for film and television production at the University of Wolverhampton and has been called the lead leading scholar on Bradbury's media adaptation history by Bradbury biographer Professor Jonathan R. Eller. If you have any questions, please type them in the Q&A box and we'll go through them at the end of the talk. Welcome, Phil. Over to you. Thank you, Claire, and good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to The Martian Chronicles at 70. Um, this year, 2020, is the centenary of the birth of Ray Bradbury. Um, so there's been lots of celebrations going on. Some of them in a very muted way, because obviously we've all been in lockdown all over the world. But um, this is my little contribution to the Bradbury centenary, is looking at um, 70 years of the Martian Chronicles. Bradbury is perhaps better known for another book, which is Fahrenheit 451, um, a book which I think Bradbury himself saw as being his legacy, and the one that would probably be remembered long after he'd been forgotten, as it were. Um, Fahrenheit 451 still hangs around sitting alongside other dystopian fiction, which has seen a bit of a resurgence in recent years. Um, so you'll often see it alongside uh, 1984, Brave New World, um, and so on. But I'm here to speak up for the Martian Chronicles. This is Ray Bradbury's gravestone, um, a very humble um, inscription on there just recording that he was author of Fahrenheit 451, just emphasizing that he saw that as being his lasting work. But I make the case tonight for the Martian Chronicles. So what is the Martian Chronicles? Well, it's a book first published in 1950 from the American publisher Doubleday based in New York. It was actually Bradbury's second book. His first book came from a small publisher and was a collection of horror stories and uh, dark tales. But the Martian Chronicles was presented uh, more as a novel, even though, as we'll see, it was really a collection of short stories stitched together. Um, it was a major achievement for Bradbury at the time because science fiction in the US in the 19, well, the beginning of the 1950s, was not seen as being a very prestige genre. Um, and indeed, Doubleday were kind of making a bit of a land grab for the genre by launching their Doubleday science fiction line. And this was one of the, one of the key books um, to be launched that year. But this humble little label, Doubleday science fiction, is something that gave Bradbury some cause for concern because he didn't think the book was science fiction. He saw the book as pure fantasy. And I'll say a bit more about that later on. So The Martian Chronicles, what exactly is it? Well, it's a book which looks to the future. It's set almost entirely on the planet Mars, starting in the year 1999, which to us is the dim and distant past, but at the time of publication was really the distant future. Um, so the book looks to the future and presents mankind's attempt to um, land on Mars, colonize Mars, uh, take it over basically. But the way the book goes about it is by looking to the past. Um, and I'll explain what I mean by that. There's, there's two or three dimensions to the way that Bradbury looks to the past in order to present the future. I'm reminded of something that Marshall McLuhan said. McLuhan was a, a sort of a media guru back in the 1960s. Um, and one of the many things that he said is that when faced with a new situation, we tend always to attach ourselves to the objects, to the flavor of the most recent past. Now McLuhan was talking mostly about our inventions. So uh, a classic example from McLuhan is uh, when the motor car was invented, the first cars looked like uh, the kind of carriages that were being drawn by horses around the same time. Um, and indeed, the early cars were called horseless carriages. So everything that we create that is new, we present it by referring to the past. We somehow take comfort from that. Or maybe it's that we don't really know what the future holds. So we're safer to look in the rearview mirror. And this is um, McLuhan's rearview mirror metaphor. 
And I think that's what Bradbury does in The Martian Chronicles. He tries to present a view of the future, but it's very much a looking back at where we've come from. Among the things that The Martian Chronicles looks back to is the earlier representation of Mars that Bradbury would have seen as a child um, growing up, the books of Edgar Rice Burroughs set on Mars, such as A Princess of Mars. In fact, Bradbury's Martian Chronicles could almost be part of the Burroughs universe. It, it occupies a very similar physical space. Um, Bradbury's Mars is full of Martians, it's full of canals, it's um, full of crystal pillars and cities, um, very similar to what's presented in Burroughs's work from early in the 20th century. Burroughs in turn was very much influenced by the very popular view at the early part of the 20th century that Mars was inhabited and that was promoted very much by the astronomer Percival Lowell um, who claimed that Mars was teeming with life because when he turned his telescope onto Mars he could see canals. Now he in turn was influenced by an earlier astronomer, Schiaparelli, an Italian, um, who had seen channels on Mars, not canals, but channels. And unfortunately, the Italian word for channel translated into English was translated as canal. And so people who read Schiaparelli in translation thought he was talking about canals and canals have connotation of man-madeness, manufacture. So um, Lowell took this really quite literally and he saw these canals and he built up a whole model of how the Martians must be living on the planet. Of course, it all turns out to be false. Um, and certainly by 1950, that was known to be not a scientific view at all. But nevertheless, this is the, the kind of influence that informs Bradbury's Martian Chronicles. So even though Bradbury publishes the book in 1950, it's very much based on a Mars that is long gone um, and was only ever a fantasy to begin with. So that's what Bradbury means when he says the Martian Chronicles is fantasy, not at all science fiction. There's another way that the Martian Chronicles looks backwards. It looks back to Frederick Turner's idea of the Amer American frontier, the idea that uh, the people of the United States have their special character, whatever that is, um, precisely and uniquely because of the way their country was built by uh, people settling first on the East Coast and then progressively working their way west, uh, conquering all in their path and gradually taking over most of the continent. Um, Turner's model um, of the American frontier is something that, that really has echoes all the way through the 20th century. John F. Kennedy's The New Frontier is an echo of Turner. Star Trek's Space the Final Frontier is an echo of Turner. Um, and even in the internet age, we have things like the Electronic Frontier Foundation. So the whole idea of a frontier um, really does seem to be quite deeply uh, rooted in the American outlook. And Bradbury really takes the American frontier and he simply transports it into space. So the Martian Chronicles, in a way, is a retelling of American history, but on the planet Mars. So these are some of the ways that the book is looking to the past. There's one other way that the Martian Chronicles looks to the past, and that is um, because of the way the, the book is built out of stories which already existed before the book existed. And I'll say something more about that in a moment. Just before moving on to that though, um, here's a quote from Borges, Jorge Luis Borges, po apologies for my terrible Spanish pronunciation. He wrote an introduction to the Martian Chronicles for an edition that was published in Argentina. And uh, as part of the introduction, he wrote the following. Bradbury writes 2004, and we feel the gravitation, the fatigue, the vast and shifting accumulation of the past, Shakespeare's dark, backward and abysm of time. So Borges very much sees that the Martian Chronicles is looking back at the, the baggage that humanity takes with it when it tries to move forward into, into outer space. And that's really what the Martian Chronicles is about. It's about the future, but it's about how we always have the baggage of the past with us and we can barely escape from it. And that holds us back and interferes with our ability to move forward. <laughs> 
in more literal terms, though, let's have a look at some of the stories that make up the Martian Chronicles. And as I say, many of these were published separately before the book existed. So the book came out in 1950, but many of the stories in the book came out prior to that. Um, some of them were brand new, hadn't been published before, but many of them had. Um, and this was really a, a kind of a, an artifact of how publishing tended to work back in those days. There were pulp magazines, which were um, the fiction for the working classes, for the poor man. Um, and then there was literary fiction, which was published in books for the, for the elite, if you like. Authors um, could sometimes have two bites at the, at the cherry. If they were able to sell their work initially to magazines and then sell it again to books, they could you know, get double the income. Well, maybe not double in financial terms, but they could get two lots of income from that. And Bradbury was one of many writers who took advantage of that. So he wrote primarily short stories, which he sold to various magazines, many of them pulp magazines, some of them more highbrow magazines, to be fair. Um, and he also then packaged his stories together and put them out as books. That's how most of his career uh, operated. He wrote a few novels, mostly though he wrote short stories and compiled short story collections. Now, The Martian Chronicles is a strange beast because it looks for all the world as if it is a novel, but it isn't. It's really a collection of short stories and they're stitched together with little joining passages, passages or bridge passages, I can't say it, bridge passages that get us from one story to another. But as I say, many of the stories had a previous life in magazines. So I'll just go through a few of the stories and give you a flavour of the sort of the key plot points of the Martian Chronicles. The first real story in the book is called Illa, which was first published, as we see here, under a different title in a magazine called Maclean's. Um, and this represents the first attempt by humans to conquer Mars, but it's told from the point of view of the Martians. And this is one of the things that the book does really well. It presents not the Earth view, but the Martian view. And this particular story is told through the viewpoint of a Martian woman who has a strange dream of an, an odd man who comes landing um, nearby in the neighbourhood. Strange dream. What she's actually doing is dreaming the landing of the first astronauts. Her husband, who is rather jealous of this, um, simply goes out and kills them. So one nil to the Martians. The, Mar <laughs> the Martians have seen off the first Earth landing, barely even noticing that these Earth people had arrived. But the story is presented through the viewpoint of the Martians, which is a really nice way of doing it. The next major event in the book is from a story called The Earthmen. Um, again, a story which had been published it previously to the book, been published two years earlier. Um, the Earthmen basically has another set of astronauts arriving on Mars. Um, they find themselves in what, for all intents and purposes, is a lunatic asylum. The Martians don't think they're from Earth at all. They keep saying, we're from that other planet. And the Martians think they must be mad. So they lock them up. And that's the end of them. 2-0 to the Martians now. Then comes another chapter, Mars is Heaven, or actually in the book it's called The Third Expedition, but it had been published two years earlier under the title Mars is Heaven. And in this one, a group of, group of astronauts arrive on Mars and they find there's a small American town there. And it's populated by people that they recognize. And it turns out basically anybody they knew who has died is now here on Mars. So for all the world, it looks as if Mars is heaven, and hence the title of the story. Turns out it's an illusion. It's an illusion presented to them by the Martians, and the Martians use it to draw them in, and then, you've guessed it, kill them off. So another failure. And this is one of the remarkable things about the Martian Chronicles. It presents this attempt to colonise a world by us, and we fail again and again and again. Um, there comes a turning point, which I'll get to in a moment, but for the most part, we're talking about abject failure um, in trying to breach this new frontier. I'll take a little break from summarising the plots to say something about the influence of Mars is Heaven. Um, no less a person than Stephen King, the horror writer, has um, 
said a lot of great things about Mars's heaven. Um, this is how he describes the story. A night of creeping horror, a night of hopeless screams and belated terror, because Mars isn't heaven after all. Mars is a hell of hate and deception and murder. Now, Stephen King first encountered the story, he tells us in his book, Dance Macabre. He first encountered the story in a radio dramatization that he heard when he was about five years old. And he says it scared the bejesus out of him. So um, Stephen King, great horror author, was influenced at a very early age by this story, which appears for all the world to be science fiction, but it's really a horror story. It just happens to be set on Mars. Um, by the way, Stephen King has also said, and I quote, without Ray Bradbury, there is no Stephen King. So he's deadly serious about the influence that Bradbury's work had on him as a beginning writer. Let's move on through some of the other stories. A big turning point in the book is the story, And the Moon Be Still as Bright. This is the one that represents the first success, if you like, for the people of Earth. Um, another expedition arrives on Mars. This is the fourth one now. Um, and this one successfully gets a foothold on the planet. How do they do it? Well, it happens purely by accident. It turns out the astronauts, the space travelers, have brought disease with them and the Martians are wiped out. And they don't die in any glorious way, they just die of chickenpox. Um, now, clearly what Bradbury is doing here, he is representing that terrible moment from American history when the Europeans came to North America, bringing with them things like smallpox um, and other diseases and decimating the native population of North America. Um, so a, a dreadful moment, if you like, but it does mean in the context of the book, this represents something of a wiping clean of the slate and allowing Mars to be something of a, well, it's a mixed metaphor, but to be a blank canvas, um, which humanity can now paint its own path onto. But there's one member of the team one member of the team of astronauts who is very sympathetic to the plight of the Martians and he insists on learning about the Martians, learning about their culture, learning about their ways and he ends up becoming a Martian or at least he thinks he does. Um, the story is ambiguous as to whether he really is possessed by a Martian or whether he's perhaps just gone a bit mad. Um, but it's a very powerful story and in the end he has to be killed, he has to be taken out uh, by his own captain um, because it's the only way of resolving a terrible situation. So this story is a major turning point in the novel, it's a success for humankind but what a price is paid for that success. Another story, I'm, I'm skipping quite a few chapters of the book at this point because there isn't time to go through all of them. I just want to mention a few sort of highlights, really. Um, another one which is a, a big highlight of the original book is Way in the Middle of the Air. And this illustration here is from the first magazine appearance of the story, which happened the same year as the Martian Chronicles, although, although I believe this story was written a couple of years earlier but it didn't see print until 1950. I think Bradbury had difficulty placing this story with any of the magazines because of the difficult themes that it dealt with. It's a profoundly anti-racist story and it's set on Earth. It's one of the few stories in the book that's set on Earth and it's set in the Deep South and it's in this sort of uh, the, the era of the Jim Crow laws. Um, and basically what happens in the story is that all the black people who are totally downtrodden and sick of being abused, they decide they've had enough. They're going to totally leave. They're going to go off to Mars. And so they do. And so as illustrated here, I think this is a, a beautiful illustration. Um, there's this tide uh, of people fleeing from the towns, leaving behind all the racist white folks um, as the black folks go off to, to find a new home and a new future for themselves. The story was withdrawn from some 
later editions of the book, and I'll say a bit more about that in a moment. The decision to remove it was Bradbury's, I should say. Um, and it's, I think it's fair to say that the story is a little bit uncomfortable um, to a modern reader. Apart from anything else, it uses the N word and it uses the, the vernacular of the racists in the mouths of the racist characters. But it is a profoundly anti-racist story. Um, and I was quite interested a week or so ago, the American writer, um, Californian writer, I think, um, Catherine H. Ross, uh, did a lecture where she talked about the influence of Bradbury on her writing. And she referred to an article she'd written earlier in the year, which I went to, to have a look at because I wasn't familiar with the article. And Catherine Ross wrote this. She wrote, when I first read this story as a teenager, it struck me between the eyes and moved me to tears. The narrative is many things. A white man writing for and not about black people. A story that suggests the clutches of racism are so strong and so perverse that the only escape is an entirely new world. The first time I ever thought about black people in the sci-fi future. And to me, that's a really profound statement that this anti-racist story had such a profound effect on somebody who was a black writer, a young black person. Um, and the comment there about um, the only escape being to find an entirely new world, I think is really quite a radical solution. And that's possibly why the story was difficult for Bradbury to sell, because it's such a radical notion that the whole um, population of black people would uh, rebel and find their own way um, was a, a deeply threatening idea back in the 1950s. I'll say a bit more about that story in a while. Um, just to round off the, the storytelling, a couple of other chapters in the book. One story that I personally like a lot, but it's perhaps not so well known as some of the others. Many of these others that I've talked about have been reprinted countless times. They've um, not only been in Bradbury's books, but they've appeared loads of times in magazines and anthologies and collections, themed collections of stories and sort of Hall of Fame science fiction books and that sort of thing. Um, this one isn't so well known. Um, originally published under the title Impossible, but in the book it's called The Martian. This is another one that existed before the book was published. Um, this one is about a, a, an old couple living on Mars. They've lost their son. And one day in the middle distance, they see what they think is their son. Turns out it's a Martian, one of the few surviving Martians who's come down from the hills um, and has this strange magical ability to turn into whoever you are thinking about. Now, for a while, they, they, they reach a nice equilibrium that the old couple are able to adopt this Martian as their son, and he is able to feel safe in their, in their home. But there comes a time where he has to go to town with, uh, with the folks, with the old folks. And once he's in the town and he's surrounded by people, he suddenly finds that the identity he has adopted is no longer stable. He has to, um, out of his control, turn into the identity of whoever these other people are. Um, and so he is constantly um, flipping his identity. He's constantly changing from one person to another to another. It's um, a, obviously a, a, a fantastical notion and a science fictional notion, um, but it's really very moving. Um, and I, I can never quite pin my, put my finger on why it is, um, but it's a very, very effective story and one of the best written in the whole of the book, in my view. A um, couple of other stories of note. I'll mention this one in passing, partly simply because I've got a funny slide here. This story, The Long Years, again, an old story, two years old by the time it appears in the Martian Chronicles, originally was published mistakenly as being by Roy Bradbury. <laughs> Clearly just a typo, but an unfortunate one. Um, this is one of the few stories in the book that you could say, well, yeah, that's science fiction, definitely, because it's got robots in it. Um, it's a scientist living on Mars. His family have died. The only way for him to overcome the loneliness is to build robots, to build replicas of his family. Um, 
this is a, a recurring theme of Bradbury and it's one of those ideas people often say Bradbury is anti-technology but he clearly isn't he so often writes stories where the way out of loneliness or despair is through technology, through robots, except his robots tend not to be the sort of tin men um, vision of robots. His robots tend to be robots that look and behave just like people. And I think that's quite far thinking of him. And if we look at the, the kind of things that we're seeing on, on TV and in film these days, things like Ex Machina and um, Humans and Westworld, we're seeing lots of things which are questioning that sort of crossover of when a thing ceases to be a machine and when does it become human. And Bradbury was dealing with all these issues in his stories way back in the 40s and 50s. Um, so The Long Years is a very good example of that form. And the last story I'll mention is the last story in the book, The Million Year Picnic. Um, and this is one of the oldest. This, public, this was four years old when it appeared in the Martian Chronicles. Some sources will tell you that Bradbury wrote this deliberately as the end of the Martian Chronicles or that he knew that it would always be the, the last chapter. Um, that actually isn't true. Uh, my friend and colleague John Eller has researched uh, Bradbury's putting together of the book and has found earlier tables of contents that Bradbury put together, kind of speculative tables of contents. Um, and in at least one of those, the millionaire picnic was not the end story, it was somewhere near the middle. But nevertheless, it is a perfect ending to the book. What happens in the million year picnic by this point, um, the earth has been destroyed. There's been a terrible war. Humans are unable to um, live with each other and they've blown the place up. There's, I suppose, a handful of survivors who've made it to the planet Mars or who were trapped on the planet Mars when the earth was destroyed. Um, and these are, if you like, the last hope of humanity. And the, the, the book ends with this story where there's a, uh, a family, parents and children, setting off um, on the canals of Mars. And the father has promised to the children, I'm going to show you the Martians. And the, the kids keep saying, when are we going to see the Martians, Daddy? When are we going to see the Martians? And he says, soon, soon. Eventually, he takes them to a place and he tells them to look into the water. So they lean over and they look into the canal and they see their own reflections. And he says, there, there are the Martians. You are the Martians. We are the Martians. Now, it's a very moving ending. It's on the one hand, it's saying we're the last survivors of humanity. We own this place now. But it's also uh, happening while they've been touring Mars and looking at the ruins of the Martian civilization. So they know that what they've in inherited, if you like, um, is, is not a, a pleasure palace. It's, it's a ruin, and it's a ruin that is the fault of humankind. That ending is also saying, you are the Martians now, is basically saying you are not Earth people anymore. You cannot go back. Earth has been destroyed. Um, and I think a third possible interpretation of the story is, well, OK, you're here and you've got this new planet to play with. But look at the mess you made of the previous one. Who's to say that this is going to turn out any better? So from a very simple metaphorical ending of we are the Martians now and looking at the reflections in the water, um, you actually have a really multifaceted, multidimensional emotional um, impact when you read that final story. I think it's one of the best stories Bradbury ever wrote. And the fact that he wrote it before he put together the Martian Chronicles is quite astonishing, um, but it's the perfect finish to the book. Um, I'm going to talk about what happened next. So after the book was published, um, what happened in the wake of the Martian Chronicles. But before I do that, um, I'd just like to put up some of Bradbury's own comments on the book. Um, Bradbury was acutely aware that what he had put together was not a novel and it wasn't a short story collection. He called it a tapestry and a half cousin to a novel. So he knew it was something strange uh, in its own terms. 
he also knew that it was not science fiction. He was adamant that this was a work of fantasy. This is not because he disliked the term, by the way. He always claimed that Fahrenheit 451 was science fiction. But the Martian Chronicles, no, it's fantasy. And this is what he said. How come the Martian Chronicles is often described as science fiction? It misfits that description. If it had been practical, technologically efficient science fiction, it would have long since fallen to rust by the road. So Bradbury recognises that if he had grounded it in real science, um, it probably wouldn't have had much of a shelf life. But what he was doing in the book, in his view, was actually constructing myth. And what he said was myth seen in mirrors, incapable of being touched, stays on. If it is not immortal, it almost seems such. Now, OK, maybe he is making a claim for, for the immortality of the book there, but I think he's hedging his bets a little bit. Um, but what he is very much recognising is the power of a good fantasy story to stick around and have an emotional and intellectual impact on the reader, which a science fiction book may not be able to sustain, because once the, the technological framework, the scientific framework behind a work of science fiction falls out of fashion or out of favour, then um, the book itself loses its value. So what happens after the Martian, Chronicle, Martian Chronicles is published? Well, the Martian Chronicles is, I would say, an unstable text. Now, what the hell does he mean by that? Well, it's an unstable text in many ways. Here's one of the ways. If you pick up a first edition, or really any edition up to about 1996, of the Martian Chronicles, you'll see the table of contents something like this, starting January 1999. Pick up a later edition and you'll see this. All of the years have moved on by 31. And clearly what was happening here, um, once we got to 1997, it was clear that the new century, the new millennium was fast approaching and all of the material in the Martian Chronicles was in danger of being out of date. So it was, I believe, Bradbury's idea to update the dates. So he simply shifted everything along. But of course, we're fast approaching 2030 now. So what should happen then? Should we shift the dates on even further? Anyway, this in itself doesn't make the Martian Chronicles an unstable text. But what it does mean is that you could pick up two editions of the Martian Chronicles and find that actually you've got two different books there at least in terms of the table of contents. So that's not a big deal. But one year after the Martian Chronicles was published, the British edition came out from a British publisher, but with a different title, The Silver Locusts. I'm guessing that Martian was not considered to be a very sellable title in Britain, so they went for something a bit more poetic. And it comes from one of Bradbury's stories in the book. He refers to the all the spaceships flying off to Mars in formation being like a, a swarm of locusts, um, or you could think of it as a plague of locusts which is going to attack the planet Mars. So the title of the book is fine. But because the book came out a year after the Martian Chronicles, Bradbury had a bit more time to think about the contents of the book and he requested some changes. So in the British edition, uh, I believe you will find uh, one story taken out and another one put in in its place. And over the passing years, other changes occur as well. So again, you could pick up two editions of the Martian Chronicles, you could read one, a friend could read one, you could then compare notes and discover that you've actually read different books, not totally different, but books with differences between them. Um, incidentally, The Silver Locusts continued to be the British title of the book right up until about 1980, when the TV miniseries based on the Martian Chronicles came out and the British publishers obviously decided they could sell a few more books if their book now had the same title as the TV series. So in 1980, you saw this switch over um, from Panther, the UK publisher, from Silver Locusts to the Martian Chronicles. But other changes happened to the book over time. So I've, I've called this slide sometimes chronicled, sometimes not. If you look through various editions 
of the Martian Chronicles. You may or may not find a story called Usher 2. You may or may not find a story called The Fire Balloons, The Wilderness, way in the middle of the air. Now, in all cases, whether you leave in or take out these stories doesn't make a huge difference to the story, but it does shift the emphasis slightly. So, for example, the story The Fire Balloons is one of the few stories with a religious theme or questions of faith. So including that in the book shifts the tone of the book ever so slightly. Um, the story we heard about earlier, Way in the Middle of the Air, is the profoundly anti-racist story. Taking that out of the book, again, changes the balance of the book. Now, Bradbury took it out because he believed that it was overtaken by events. He thought of all the stories in the book, it was the one that was least credible, not because of any science fictional reasoning, but simply because it depicted an American South that he thought didn't exist anymore. And he may well have been wrong in that regard. But I think removing it from the book is probably right, simply because of the language issue. Um, but there are variant versions of the Martian Chronicles. That makes it an unstable book. The Martian Chronicles casts a long shadow, is my next claim. Um, and really what I'm suggesting here is precisely because the book is made up of short stories which can be taken in isolation, the book and its contents have been adapted many, many times. The individual short stories have turned up in all sorts of radio adaptations over the years, American adaptations in series Escape, Dimension X, X-1, Bradbury 13, and the whole book has been adapted a couple of times for radio. Um, there was a version by Colonial Radio, radio Theatre and a the rather poor version by the BBC, although it had Derek Jacobi in it, so, you know, it, it, it got some headlines because of that. So the individual stories keep coming back in the radio medium and the book keeps coming back in the radio medium and visually as well. Um, there's a, a whole line of influence that you can trace through the TV series The Twilight Zone, which I, I won't go into in any detail, but there's at least a couple of episodes which look remarkably like stories from The Martian Chronicles. Bradbury had some small involvement in the series. Um, but the influence of Bradbury and the Martian Chronicles, I think, is bigger through the series. But that's a discussion for another day. Bradbury's own TV series of the 1980s and the 1990s, almost a unique series um, where he wrote all the episodes himself, 65 of them. Um, he adapted a number of the stories from the Martian Chronicles, some of them successfully, some of them not. And of course, those of us of a certain age will remember Rock Hudson on the planet Mars around 1980, a rather lacklustre TV miniseries. Um, Bradbury himself said it was boring and he got told off by NBC television, who told him he couldn't say that, but he said it anyway. Um, anyway, Bradbury had spent decades trying to get the Martian Chronicles onto the screen and he'd written a number of screenplays over the years and um, none of them had sold. And he was always bitterly disappointed at his inability to get the show on the screen. Um, it eventually got there and when it did, it was written by somebody else and it was poorly directed, which is a great shame. I mentioned a long shadow. I claimed the Martian Chronicles had a long shadow. Because of Bradbury's um, interest in space as expressed really just in that one book. It's, it's really the only book that contains stories about space. There are one or two stories in a couple of other short story collections he put out, but this is the only sustained space book that he published. He somehow became a spokesman for the space age during the 1960s and onwards. He uh, wrote some articles for Life magazine which were about the space race. He interviewed astronauts for Life magazine. So, you know, he journalistically, he became very involved um, in the reality of the space race. And he found himself being interviewed all the time 
about the reality of getting people to the moon and onward to Mars. And in the early 70s, when the Mariner 9 probe became the first probe to really get good close-up views of the planet Mars, he was called into a symposium by three major planetary scientists, uh, Walter Sullivan, Bruce Murray, Carl Sagan, and he and Arthur C. Clarke were the sort of representatives of science fiction, if you like. Um, and this was the first of many, many engagements that he had with real scientists, real space scientists. And it led to an ongoing relationship with um, NASA and JPL, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, based in Pasadena. He would often give speeches there. He was always a welcome guest. He got standing ovations whenever he addressed scientists there. He even um, was allowed to drive a Mars rover, or at least a, a replica of one for which he received his Mars driving license. Um, so this most unscientific of authors who even claimed that his book is not science fiction was nevertheless well in with the scientists. Um, and when he died in 2012, NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory posted a, uh, an excerpt from that Mars symposium um, showing Bradbury reading one of his poems. So he was really held in very high regard by space scientists. And in 2015, there was a limited edition version of the Martian Chronicles that came out with an introduction which included uh, this passage of text. Could it be possible that we are forever unable to go beyond who we were? Will every great opportunity of discovery be tainted, tarred and eventually destroyed by our own clumsy, brutish hand? This is talking about those repeated failures uh, within the Martian Chronicles of the human beings. The introduction goes on to say, if the answer was simply yes, if this book stopped there, it could not have lasted. And possibly therein lies its longevity and its ability to both challenge and inspire successive generations of readers. So this introduction absolutely recognises that the Martian Chronicles succeeds because it shows us the baggage that we bring with us whenever we move forward into the future. And yet we have to overcome that. Uh, in order to find the bright new day. Um, this particular introduction was written by Chris Hadfield, who you may know as the Canadian astronaut, you know, the guy who sang um, David Bowie songs in the International Space Station. So another prime example of Bradbury's art influencing somebody involved in space. I'm going to wrap it up there because we're rapidly running out of time. Um, but just to sum up, I'm claiming that the Martian Chronicles looks to the future by looking to the past. Um, and I hope I've demonstrated that in various ways this evening. I maintain that it's an unstable text because the book keeps changing, or it seems to. Some people will say, ah, it's not that much of a change. But I swear to you, pick up an, an edition of the Martian Chronicles and you cannot guarantee that you've got the same version as I have. And the Martian Chronicles has cast a very long shadow and is still relevant to this day. So I shall finish by saying, happy birthday, The Martian Chronicles, and happy 100th birthday to Ray Bradbury. And that's the end of my talk. So I'll now invite Claire to come back in. Thanks, Phil. Um, that was great. I really enjoyed that. Um, we've got a couple of uh, comments and, and a question. So from Karma Spence, um, I think The Martian is my favourite story in the book, and, and certainly The Martian Chronicles is my favourite of, of Ray's books. Um, so just a couple of comments there. Uh, and Trevor Davis asks, do you anticipate further screen adaptations? Oh, that's a good one. Um, I do anticipate further screen adaptations because the book has been constantly optioned by Hollywood production companies almost ever since it was written. Um, so sooner or later, somebody's got to make a film out of it. Um, I'm pretty sure Bradbury, when he was alive, and probably the Bradbury estate now that he's passed on, are continuing to make income from Hollywood, not making films. But sooner or later, they've got to actually make one, I'm sure. Yes. Um, there are any more questions, anyone? Um, just a, a comment from um, Pritpal. If I could applaud you, I would, Dr. Phil. So thanks for that, Pritpal. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Um, <laughs> um, Karma asked, which, which is the best radio adaptation? I guess in your opinion. 
the best radio adaptation. Um, the best adaptation of the book as a whole is the one by Colonial Radio Theatre because they literally did the entire book. They didn't leave anything out. Um, it's quite long. Um, best individual story adaptation is probably in the series Bradbury 13, which you can occasionally pick up on BBC Seven. Um, so have a look out, look out for those on BBC Seven. Okay, thank you for that. This one from Mark B2. Excellent presentation. I read the book when I was a teenager and I made the connection of how cultures destroy each other very deep. Mm. Yeah, That's very, it. very good observation. It's, it is unfortunately all about destruction that the, the earth is destroyed and the Martian civilization is destroyed. So yeah, very destructive, but it does end at least on a positive note um, for the humans who survive at the end. Okay, um, this one from Karma. Will the recording of this, oh, will this presentation be made available? Yes, absolutely, Karma, it will. Um, we're going to upload it to uh, the university's YouTube channel. So if you just keep an eye out for that over the next few days and it should be there so you can, you can re-watch it. A um, few other questions come in. Um, thank you from uh, Trevor Davis, truly excellent. Paul Trigg asks, why do I now have a craving for hot dogs? <laughs> Now that's a, that's a reference that anyone who's read the book will understand. There's there's a story um, in the book called I think it's the off season, which is about a guy who sets up a hot dog um, stall on Mars. Um, but unfortunately, it's the off season. Nobody comes. He doesn't have any customers. But you can at least get hot dogs on Mars. <laughs> right. Okay. This one from uh, Rossi Umberto. He says, I guess that part time. I'm sorry, part of the shadow cast by MC is P.K. Dick's Martian Time Slip, which in my uh, honest opinion is one of Dick's best novels. But Mars seems to have been his favourite solar planet, as also the three stigmata of Palmer Eldridge is set up there. Yes, I, years ago I read almost everything that Philip K. Dick wrote. Um, I have to admit I've forgotten most of it now and I, I can't remember when those books were published. I'm sure there would have been an influence, but, but Dick and Bradbury were near contemporaries, so they were writing around the same time. I think Bradbury was just a few years ahead of Dick. Okay. Uh, Trevor Davis asks, is there a definitive edition in your view? Definitive edition of the book? Um, not really. There was a book a few years ago, well, probably about 15, almost 20 years ago, called The Complete Martian Chronicles, which claimed to be definitive. But all they did essentially was take the text of the 1997 edition and then add in a load of other Martian stories that um, were stories that had never been part of the Martian Chronicles. So it was a strange collection. It's got all of the Martian stories in there but it's not really a single cohesive book. It's more of a collection of odds and ends. Mm. Um, this one from Tony, he asks, any thoughts about why sci-fi has grown so much compared to the 50s? Um, I do have thoughts on that. I think it, it simply reflects the world in which we live, um, that we're living in a world of technological wonders, which sometimes turn out to be wonders and sometimes turn out to be terrible things that will <laughs> destroy us. Um, but I think every, every day when we watch a news story, there, there are things that are to do with science and technology. It's the world in which we live. I mean, we're living through a pandemic right now, which represents science's inability to come up with a solution until we do have a solution, then we will celebrate science for coming up with the solution. Yes, interesting. Um, Rob Kane asks, is Martian Common, I can't say it, chronicles a story about the American West or small town life? Yes and yes. Um, I think it is all of those things. There are some people who say that Bradbury is very nostalgic, that he writes a lot about small towns, uh, which is true, and there are some nostalgic elements in the Martian Chronicles, but what I always, I always point out to people is that the most nostalgic story in the book is one where the, the small old town turns out not to be a small old town. It turns out to be something that's going to kill you. So um, it's not as sweet and nostalgic as you might think. Hmm. Uh, this one from Mark B2. Do the current versions include the N-word? Generally not. Generally, the more recent editions um, have um, 
way in the middle of, of the air removed um, at Bradbury's suggestion. Instead, what you tend to get, um, there's a story called The Wilderness, which is one of the few stories about women on Mars. So um, Bradbury sort of takes away with one hand and then gives with the other. Um, I, my personal view is that way in the middle of the air is problematic because of the language in the same way that um, Huckleberry Finn, Mark Twain's Huckleberry Finn, is, is often challenged on the basis of the language that's in there, even though it's a profoundly anti-racist book because it uses the language of the, well, of the, of the time in which it was written, but it uses the language um, which now is racist terminology, the book is often challenged. And so I think Bradbury was probably right to withdraw that story because it sort of protects the book um, from being seen as a, a, a relic of a, of a distant past and it enables the book to flourish in our modern times. You can still get the story, um, even though it's been removed, you can still get that story. It's in other collections of Bradbury's. Okay, um, this one from Michael Griffiths. Did he write any stories or books for juveniles ESX as Heinlein did? Um, sort of. Well, he, he had some books published that were more for juveniles. So, for example, The Halloween Tree was published as if it were for younger readers, although apparently he didn't write it as such, and it was more sort of um, watered down to suit a younger audience. And some of his stories were collected together in books which were aimed at younger audiences. So there's a collection called R is for Rocket and S is for Space. Um, and then there were some uh, books for, for really small children. Um, there was a, a thing called Switch on the Night, um, which is a, a very short book for very young children. Um, but he, he didn't really write juvenile science fiction as such. He, he more wrote for adults in that, in that genre. Okay, um, a couple of uh, comments from Rossi Umberto. Thanks for a great lecture and Mark Gallagher. Uh, thanks a lot, really enjoyed this talk. And um, that concludes the questions, Phil. Um, have you got anything else to add? No, I'm, I'm very pleased that people have posted questions. Thank you very much. I've, I've done events like this previously um, and I'm always disappointed when I don't get any questions or comments at the end. <laughs> you often wonder, is anyone actually listening? But <laughs> clearly people were this evening, so that's very good. Really great. Um, a couple of other comments um, just before you go. Tony Sismi says, really enjoyed the event style and content. Thanks for organising. Um, so yeah, thanks very much, Phil. Um, Thank we'll definitely um, get you talking for Arts Fest again. I think that was <laughs> That was that, that went really well. Um, your knowledge of the Martian Chronicles is truly astonishing. I mean, you know, I, I learned so many things from these talks now. I'm going to be an expert. <laughs> Thanks everyone for sending in your questions. Um, our next Arts Fest online event will be on Thursday, the 19th of November, and is a webinar book launch for pen, print, and communication in the 18th century. This can be booked through Eventbrite. Thanks all for watching. See you all soon. Thank you. Bye.